can go ahead and get started here. Um, I'll provide a quick intro. So thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, today our speaker is Dermot O'Brien, who is a project officer within the Joint Research Center at the European Commission. He works on innovative applications of blockchain for the transportation sector. Previously, Dermot worked at Ernst & Young on both data analytics projects for EY Risk UKI. And in addition, he reviewed smart contracts written in Solidity for the Zero X protocol and the Kyber network, looking for security flaws and providing assurance for EY Global. Uh, thanks again for joining us, Dermot. Uh, we are very excited about your presentation today. Uh, before we get started, a few reminders for everybody in the audience, please make sure you're muted and that your video is off. At the end, we will have time for Q&A, so if you have questions throughout the presentation, post them in the chat box and we'll get to them once Dermot has wrapped up his talk. Uh, the lecture is being recorded and it'll be available on our website tomorrow. Uh, you can share it at that point. And with that being said, I will hand it over to you, Dermot. Take it away. Thanks very much for inviting me uh, today. Um, I will be presenting on uh, the exploratory research within the European Commission on blockchain for transport applications, uh, specifically on road vehicle identity and uh, emission monitoring system, where uh, the EC, together with uh, Mobi, um, performed a pilot to test the performance of such a system. Okay, my clicker is working. Uh, so um, we have six sites located across um, um, Europe. Um, and uh, the JRC has a, over 60 years of scientific experience, uh, continually um, building on uh, scientific knowledge and uh, helping to support policy. Uh, we have specialist laboratories, unique research facilities, and is home to thousands of uh, scientists uh, across the EU. Um, we are policy neutral, so although we uh, try to help support uh, policy, um, we have no policy agenda of our own. We are more than 50 large-scale research facilities, more than 110 online databases, about 3,000 staffs, nearly 70% of which are scientific technical uh, staff, and 83% of uh, us have uh, PhDs, and we produce roughly 1,400 uh, scientific publications per year. Uh, we're independent of private, commercial, or national interest. Like I said, we're policy neutral, and we work for 20 uh, director generals, so 20 European Commission policy uh, departments. Um, we have a history of scientific excellence. So over 40 to 50% of the JRC publications belong to the top 25 most cited publications. 23% belong to the top 10 and 3% belong to the top 1% uh, most cited publications. Um, I have assumed that the audience will have a, a basic understanding of blockchain, uh, so I won't um, talk about uh, how blockchain works or any of this. I will, however, introduce uh, digital identity, zero knowledge proofs, and other technological components that are good to just briefly go over because they're key for the um, pilots that uh, the European Commission and Mobi uh, collaborated on. So to start off, uh, digital identity is defined by ISO 29115 as a set of attributes relating to an entity, where an entity can be a person, device, machine, property, service, institution, government, or business. Uh, identity is perceived indirectly through attributes relating to an entity. So for example, height, gender, hair color, uh, the name of a person, these are all attributes that we associate to, in this case, a person, but it could be an entity of any sort. Um, we also have different identities. So um, depending on who you're interacting with, you will want to share a different set of attributes. So for example, uh, in a personal relationship or a friendship, um, 
you might share your, your birthday, your nickname, uh, other kind of more social identity attributes, but you might also want an identity associated to your professional identity, where you might also show uh, share your employee ID, uh, not share your relationship status. So really our identity depends on who we're interacting with and what attributes we want to share with them. Um, also, depending on the website or service we want to use, we will want to share a, a different set of attributes for them. Uh, so each entity, in this case, a person will have many identities and uh, for many different web uh, services or uh, depending who they are interacting with. Um, I will briefly give uh, mention zero knowledge proofs. Um, which is a cryptographic method in which a prover can show to a verifier that a claim is true without providing any additional information to the verifier or leaking information about the claim. This reduces such things as um, disclosure of sensitive data to verifiers and increases privacy while allowing for proof that certain parameters are met. Uh, or that they fall within a, a required range. Uh, for example, with zero knowledge range proofs, I can just say, uh, for example, uh, am I within a certain age category such that I should get some discount? So maybe uh, I, I don't tell them my exact age, but I can verify that I'm uh, above the age of 65, for example. So you're minimizing the uh, uh, amount of data you're sharing and you're reduced reducing the disclosure. Um, here's a very oversimplified illustration of how zero knowledge proofs work. I didn't want to go into too much detail, but just to give you a rough feeling. Uh, for example, Alice wants to prove to Bob here that uh, she can go through a, a, a locked door. Uh, and um, this can be proved when they have uh, the key or certain attributes. There are many other ways to describe this in a simplified way, but I, I didn't want to go into too much technical details. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you uh, know in a technical way how zero knowledge proofs work anyway. Um, normally when we're interacting on the web, uh, we use uh, commonly X509 certificates, also um, Hyperledger Fabric and other uh, technologies use X509 certificates. There are a particular format of public key certificates that links uh, public keys to an entity's name signed by a certificate authority who is a trusted network administrator. This enables secure communication between entities or authority uh, or authorizes transactions or validates data or uh, or documents via digital signatures with corresponding private key. Um, although the problem is here, if you notice uh, the trusted network administrator, the certificate authority, um, it's uh, often in the case where it's, for example, Facebook or Google, it means they have all your data, they know everything about you, and you're not really in control of that data in, a, in, an, a, in, in an easy way. You need to go through many hurdles to be able to get that data, to ask them to delete it, uh, and it gives them a lot of power as the central entity that controls all the data and knows who is who. Uh, Self-sovereign identities utilize data identifiers that are kept offline and are carried by the owner, which in the case of our pilot is the vehicle. This uh, increases the security with respect to centralized digital certificate solutions. Uh, also, there's no single point of failure. Uh, you don't need to ver uh, trust in uh, a company's or entity's uh, data protection policies and many other things. And when used in combination with zero knowledge proofs, uh, allows for increased privacy, uh, allowing to prove your identity on the internet or network in a secure way that helps your credentials and information remain private. Uh, Self-sovereign identity incorporates two main standards, that of decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials or claims. Uh, decentralized identifiers uh, use cryptographic methods for identification of an entity, in this case, uh, a vehicle. Verifiable credentials uh, enable authentication of a credential or claim 
often with a focus on privacy when used uh, in conjunction with zero knowledge proofs. So uh, an issuer um, can issue a claim, the vehicle can countersign the claim, it then submits the claim uh, to a verifier who then verifies the signatures. Um, I will also uh, revisit this uh, in the uh, case of uh, Mobi and Mobi systems uh, where they have specific names and uh, we will revisit this diagram um, for the different um, um, steps within uh, the Mobi platform uh, when issuing and verifying a, a credential or claim. So why, why, what attributes are, are interesting uh, from blockchain uh, that can be applied to transport, not just in the case of where you're using it for an identity management system, but there are also um, some positive benefits uh, when you consider uh, um, data provenance or integrity. So uh, when you persist data on a blockchain, but uh, for the situation of our pilot, we used it purely as an identity management system. Um, but you could also on top of that connect uh, a, a ledger where data is uh, persisted and you have the full provenance of that data. So these benefits are immutability, very hard to change the history of the hashes stored within a blockchain. Decentralized timestamping, there's a clear record of what data was transmitted where, when uh, without needing to trust a single entity. Non-repudiation due, due to the above two uh, points, immutability and decentralized timestamping, it's very hard to dispute um, the validity of uh, recorded data um, or the hash. Um, the security is, is increased in a decentralized network. There is no single point of failure. When also using zero knowledge proofs and doing off-chain computations, you can have increased privacy, uh, yet uh, show that the data, uh, that a statement or claim is true or that data falls within a certain range. Uh, identity management, uh, when using DLT or blockchain, you have access to more advanced uh, identity management solutions such as zero knowledge proofs, uh, uh, sorry, such as uh, self-sovereign identities um, and also automation. Uh, so when you want to write a smart contract, so something happens uh, when a condition is met, um, you can reuse or, um, and many different parties can audit a smart contract doing a specific functionality. And this will then increase the, um, or decrease the likelihood of a bug or a flaw or a weakness uh, when many people can audit the smart contract and reuse if, if it's relevant for them. Um, now I will, give a regulatory background of our pilot uh, within the EU regulations. Uh, I will first talk about regulations relating to uh, emissions, uh, monitoring and uh, devices within cars. I will then go on to talk about uh, the general data protection regulation, the uh, EIDAS regulation, which is for electronic identification, and then finally, the proposal to amend the EIDAS regulation, which uh, wants to amend it to contain a European digital identity. Um, so regulation 2018-1832 uh, from November 2018 decreed that um, all newly created vehicles starting from 1st of January 2021, must contain an onboard fuel and or energy consumption monitoring device, an OBFCM. Um, the ensuing regulation, Regulation EU 2019-631, uh, further detailed that the European Commission are required to store and record, uh, uh, store a record of the vehicle's emission data reported by member states. Uh, parameters that need to be shared from the OBFCM devices with the European Commission 
is the vehicle identification number, the total distance traveled, and the total fuel and or energy consumed, um, the, and indeed any other parameter required to ensure the obligation of the European Commission to monitor and assess the real world representativeness of the fuel consumption or energy consumption. Um, this came um, for hybrid vehicle and other vehicles. There are other parameters that need to be shared. I will mention these briefly later, but for a standard combustion vehicle um, or electric vehicle, um, these would be the data points needed to share. Uh, I will talk about GDPR later uh, after this section, but if you notice the vehicle identification number, uh, this is not something the European Commission really wants to have because it is personal identifying information and really we, we don't want this, uh, we don't want to touch it. But the reason why this regulation also contained the VIN number is because um, there is no standardized way at the moment on the vehicle's onboard devices in which they contain model and device type. So I think at the time of this regulation, they decided to share, uh, to also include the VIN or, or indeed any other parameter required. So pretty much anything we want. But the reason it was the VIN uh, was so that um, we could um, find out uh, from the registration authorities what the model type of the vehicle is, what the brand is, and basically uh, this is information we need to uh, do the reporting because you need to say what car is emitting what values of CO2. Uh, but ideally, we don't want the VIN, we just need to know model type uh, and, uh, and brand and th this type of information. Uh, for the standard combustion vehicle, uh, as I mentioned, it's total distance traveled and total fuel consumed. For a hybrid vehicle, we also require total distance traveled in charge depleting operation with engine off, total distance traveled in driver selectable increasing operation, Total fuel consumed in charge depleting operation, total fuel consumed in driver selectable charge increasing operation, total grid energy consumed in charge depletion operation with engine turned off, and then the same with engine running. Uh, so uh, quite a few more data points for the, the hybrid vehicle uh, to meet our uh, reporting requirements. Uh, the regulation 2019-631 also stated three modes of data collection. Uh, consisting of data derived from member states, manufacturers, or directly from the vehicles themselves, uh, which is the scenario we were exploring. For manufacturers, you could um, connect the different ERP systems or have a trusted way in which you can receive the data. But the thing is after Volkswagen, the whole reason we're doing this uh, is because of the diesel gate when we no longer trust the manufacturer, although they do receive the OBSEM data directly to their servers. So you could envision a way where you're connecting the different databases together, uh, maybe using something like base ledger or baseline protocol uh, previously known as. Um, and member states, um, we have to do a periodic technical inspection. So in Italy, it's once every two years, so the problem with that is since we have, as the European Commission, the obligation to receive the data once every year, for Italy, where you only have the, uh, the technical inspection uh, bi-yearly, the, the member states don't have the data granularity required uh, to report to the European Commission. Um, although, we have already regulated in regulation 2021-392 that uh, member states and manufacturers are obliged to compile this data from the OBFCM devices and transmit it once a year to the European Commission, uh, currently via data exchange platform provisioned by the European Environmental Agency. 
Uh, I will now briefly touch upon the general data protection regulation as here in Europe, it affects, it feels like it affects every regulate or most regulations, technologies and everything. And really uh, the gender, the GDPR uh, kind of contains the values of uh, Europe. Um, so although this regulation causes a lot of headache, this is a regulation we're very proud of and really it, it enshrines EU values. And uh, um, I will briefly mention some of the main regulatory points within the GDPR, uh, which are relevant for our pilot and uh, most likely uh, other uh, blockchain applications. Um, so the GDPR was published on in April 2016, uh, enacted in May 2018, and is the fundamental law for the pro uh, data protection and privacy of EU citizens. It, encom uh, it encompasses EU principles and rights, enabling the protection of personal data and the free flow of non-personal data. Uh, which is also key because that promotes sharing and increases economic value. And uh, the, the, the key relevant components of the GDPR for the application of blockchain, as I mentioned, are as follows. Um, the security of processing of personal data, where the controller and the processor of the personal data in a system must have appropriate protective measures, both technical and organizational against security threats to the system that could put at risk the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, or unauthorized disclosure of uh, personal data uh, transmitted, stored, or otherwise processed. Um, the data protection by design and by default uh, requires the controller um, in the divine design phase of the system uh, to consider how the personal data can be protected and implemented during the production phase of their system. Uh, these principles include, but are not limited to data minimalization, uh, pseudonymization. In addition, measures need to be in place by the data controller that only personal data are processed solely for the intended purpose, including both the quantity and the length of time that the data is stored. Um, there is also conditions for consent. The data controller must be able to provide evidence that a data subject has provided their consent to process their personal data. The data subject has the right to revoke, revoke the consent given at any time and with ease. Um, it can't be too difficult. Uh, if you make it so difficult that it's practically impossible, then it's not actually uh, the it's not actually in place. We also uh, there is also the right to be forgotten. So the data subject has the right to instruct the data controller to erase their personal data from the system in question, either because the personal data are no longer uh, needed or simply because the data subject has now decided to withdraw their consent. The data control controller must act to erase or modify the data without delay, um, where the data subject may request their personal data be modified to reflect changes that have also occurred. Um, the data subject also has right of access. So um, if I want to have confirmation as to whether a system uh, processes my information or obtains uh, personal data uh, that is processed by a system, uh, including information on what the purpose of the processing is. So I can say, why are you processing my data? How, um, what data, what personal data are you using? Where the data has been processed? So if any other party has been had access to it, and for how long it is being held, who else uh, also has access, whether or not they've even accessed it. This information shall be easily provided to the data subject, although the controller may charge a reasonable administrative fee. Uh, again, you notice 
that it needs to be easy for the data subject to get the information they require. We can't make it too difficult. Um, also data portability, the data subject has the right to request and receive their personal data that uh, has been held or processed by a system in a structured and uh, common machine readable format. In addition, the data subject should be able to transfer said data to another data controller if they wish uh, without any obstruction or hindrance. I want to change servers. It, I, I can take my data from one platform and port it to another and then ask the previous platform to delete it. Uh, responsibility of the con data controller. It is the data controller's obligation to implement sufficient organization and technical structures to ensure that the processing of personal data adheres to GDPR within the nature, scope, context, and pers uh, purpose of the data process taken into account in relation to the risks and severity of breach for the freedom and rights of the data subject. So this is where you do your risk and control matrix, and also you you kind of for more severe risks you you you. So you need to um, have the proper organizational uh, measures such that um, things with a very high risk and which can have a massive effect are taken very seriously and um, are are prevented from happening. The application of GDPR applies to open systems connected to the internet and closed systems, which are not linked to a local area network or the internet. There are certain activities though that do not fall under GDPR, such as for law enforcement authorities that function to prosecute criminals, uh, activities based outside the Europe that do not interact within the EU, and personal activities of an individual, such as for uh, household activities, um, GDPR does not apply. Uh, also, uh, I forgot to mention data retention. Uh, the GDPR states that the length of time for which the personal data of the subject is held does not exceed its intended purpose, where depending on said purpose and the context for which the data subject has given permission, it may vary in different contexts. So basically, um, I can only hold uh, someone's data as a data controller for the length of time that is needed for the permission and consent given and the application. Um, the next regulation I wanted to mention um, is the electronic identification and trust services for electronic transactions in the internal market, uh, or commonly known as the IDAS. Um, the IDAS regul regulation was published in 2014 and aimed to increase trust in electronic transactions within the single market by creating a common framework for secure electronic interactions between public authorities, businesses, and citizens. Uh, hoping to increase the efficiency of private and public services online. The regulation includes the requirements that an advanced electronic signature uh, must satisfy, uh, satisfy. The Commission Communication a Digital Agenda for Europe of the 26th of August uh, 2010 outlined the issue of fragmentation within European digital market, pointing out issues relating to lack of interoperability, and the rise of cybercrime uh, creating major frictions to the success of the European digital economy, where many national, um, many member states would have divergent uh, national uh, methods. Um, the EI dish regulation was originally created to support, uh, as I said, integration of the European digital single market by enabling cross border application of digital services. Um, this, it was hoped that uh, this would generate suitable circumstances for uh, bilateral interaction and uh, enable cross-border interactions such as electronic identification, electronic documents, electronic signatures, uh, interoperable, interoperable e-government services throughout the EU, um, where 
um, there is also um, the priority um, of the security of the electronic signatures and the requirement to establish a public key infrastructure at the pan-European level. The requirements of the advanced electric, uh, electronic signatures must adhere to uh, each signatory um, that it is unique to each signatory, uh, can identify the signatory accur accurately, and the, date, uh, the data that the subject's electronic signature is linked to when tampered with should be easily detectable. All member states must accept an electronics timestamp issued by another member state in a way in which the data and the timestamp must be linked to the data in a way in which the data is resistant to tampering, as mentioned before, without detection and is signed using the above uh, advanced electronic signature requirements such that the integrity and accuracy or the time of this, the stamp is not in question. Regul uh, EIDAS regulation is the only framework for a trusted cross-border electronic identification of a natural person in the EU. Following its enactment in 2014, it was based on the national electronic identity systems that are conditional to diverse standards and only facilitate the electronic identification needs of a small segment of the EU citizens and businesses. So basically EIDAS was meant to help everyone and only in the way it was implemented and laid out helped a few EU citizens and businesses and was not the, uh, the electronic ID um, uh, regulation that uh, was required and was hoped that it would be. Um, so more recently, um, we have a proposal for uh, amending the EIDAS regulation in regards to establishing a framework for a European digital identity. Uh, this was published in June of 2021. Uh, after the COVID pandemic, um, there has been a dramatic uh, rate increase of digitalization um, and has led or forced public and private sectors uh, to conforming to digital services where EU citizens expect that business activities or public service activities such as enrolling at a foreign university, doing tax declaration, banking, car rental, loans, insurances, or any authentication of the internet for payments or uh, other services should all be digital and with a high level of assurance and security, privacy, and with convenience for the user. Um, so the, as I mentioned, this increased rate of digitalization has created the demand for means to authenticate and identify it online. This includes the need to exchange information relating to one's identity uh, digitally, such as certificates, attributes about a person, qualifications, uh, your driving license, your residence, your age, uh, permits, or, or payment information. The, the, need to, this, the need to authenticate and identify online has really sparked a new paradigm for adoption of advanced and convenient solutions that can integrate different verifiable data and certificates by the user. Users expect an environment where they, they are self-determined, uh, where various credentials and attributes can be carried by them and shared with who they want to. Um, also, I feel I should mention, all of these quote marks are taken directly from the regulation. So, um, when I, I'm talking about um, these so-called self-sovereign app-based wallets, which are managed through the mobile device of the user, allowing for secure and easy access to different services, both in public and private sectors under their full control. It's specifically worded in the regulation mentioning self-sovereign apps, self-sovereign identity, a distributed ledger. I, I will continue to go through, but um, this regulation really is looking at providing 
the need for advanced identity solutions such as self-sovereign identity um, and establishing the framework for a European digital identity. This proposal to amend EIDAS aims for the provision of cross-border use of access to highly secure and trustworthy electronic identity solutions. Uh, public and private services uh, should be able to rely on trusted and secure digital identity solutions. Natural and legal persons are empowered to use digital identity solutions, so it should be easy, it shouldn't be too hard, they should be able to do it uh, with ease and uh, uh, these solutions uh, will be linked to a variety of attributes and allow for the targeted sharing of identity data limited to the needs of the specific service requested. So data minimalization uh, and the control of the data subject to say who's getting what, who's sh what data they're sharing with who and for how long. A new environment has emerged where attention is directed to provisioning of trust attributes associated with identity, attempting to facilitate the authentication and identification of users with a high level of assurance while putting the users in control of their own data and identity in a user-friendly way. If you notice in the regulation, it just keeps reiterating the same points. Users should be in control of their own da data and identity in a friendly way. The European Digital Identity Framework provides European citizens uh, also with who has access to their digital twin uh, and for how long. A high level of security assurance is required for such services and for the issuance of a European digital identity wallet and the infrastructure related to the collection and the storage and disclosure of digital identity data. Um, I probably need to speed up as I am running out of time. Um, so I will just briefly uh, run through these slides um, as I'm probably re repeating myself too much. I think I might just skip this one. It's all about harmonized European approach to trust, security, interoperability. So just really reiterating uh, what's already been previously said and specifically mentioning that participants should be able to rely on verifiable proofs of identity, attestations of attributes and verifiable claims. So pretty much everything self-sovereign identity and other advanced identity solutions uh, contain as a standard within them. Um, this is just reiterating the same uh, that's already been mentioned where, but just that the regulation is specifically mentioning having qualified electronic ledgers to record data and the use of uh, advanced solutions for self-sovereign identity uh, to support the transformation of both public and private services. Okay, so now we, uh, there should have been an in-between slide um, saying Mobi pilot, but okay, anyways, this is a new section. Uh, the Mobi Web3 digital infrastructure leverages zero knowledge proofs and the W3C verifiable uh, credential standard. Uh, Mobi launched two Web3 infrastructure initiatives to test and scale Mobi standards, the Integrated Trust Network and Zootopia. Together with the Mobi Consortium, the digital infrastructure from the Mobi Web3 technology stack. Um, the MTS comprises the foundational technologies, sorry, the uh, Mobi technology stack um, comprises the foundational technologies needed to verify decentralized transactions uh, between connected entities. Uh, the foundational layer, uh, the Mobi consortium creates standards to identify connected entities and shared business processes. The Mobi consortium is comprised of as all of you probably know, the world's largest vehicle manufacturers and many other uh, leading uh, technology companies. The middle layer uh, is the Integrated Trust Network, the ITN, uh, formerly known as Mobinet, is a protocol agnostic digital infrastructure to provide trusted identity services. The goal is to unlock uh, monetization opportunities across campus mobility services. 
by allowing application interoperability and multi-party data sharing, enabling participants to execute trusted decentralized transactions. The top layer, which is Zootopia, is a trustless decentralized marketplace to onboard SSDTs, uh, self-sovereign digital twins, and enable verifiable credential issuance for business automation using zero knowledge proofs, monetizing assets such as infrastructure, services, and data. Zootopia enables countless track and trace use cases in the supply chain and unlocks marginal cost pricing for numerous mobility as a service transactions, including urban roll turning, meter fee parking, congestion management, use space insurance, uh, and in our case, uh, emissions monitoring. Each layer provides a different architecture and functions separate for decentralization, together forming a holistic approach to the Web3 applications for the connected ecosystem. Uh, in the pilot between Mobi and the European Commission, uh, we tested the performance and scalabilities of Zootopia for transactions, exchange of value, goods, or data. Between the European Commission, 27 member state regi vehicle registration authorities, and connected vehicles using Mobi's decentralized identity solution, the ITN, uh, the ITN did method. Um, so the, um, the three process uh, flows required for the vehicle identity management system were tested for performance. Uh, I will, on the next slide, uh, go through these process flows. The simulation aimed to test the use case of vehicle emissions self-reporting with self-sovereign identity uh, infrastructure where self-sovereign digital twins and verifiable credentials are created on Zootopia to simulate the interaction between the European Commission, member state vehicle registration authorities and, and the vehicles. Um, we assumed within the European Union that there were 280 million vehicles and we wanted to test the scalability and performance of uh, Mobi's platform. The simulation included three uh, flows required for the vehicle identity management system. So you have the issue vehicle registration credential flow, which simulates the vehicle registering themselves with member state vehicle registration authorities. Just to put this in a more simple, it's uh, basically what the DMV is. I guess it's called the DMV in, in America or in the USA. So yeah, basically I'm talking about the DMV, but uh, anyways, uh, and receiving their verifiable credentials. Um, Self-issue vehicle data credential flow when used for CO2 emissions or energy consumption simulates vehicle reporting emission data to the European Commission with verifiable credentials. And the verified data credential flow simulates the European Commission verifying the vehicle credential and the reporting data credential from the individual vehicle. Um, Self-sovereign digital twins, as mentioned before, and verifiable credentials are created on Zootopia to simulate the interaction between the, the previous three mentioned entities. Um, so the issue vehicle registration credential flow, a vehicle asks the member state vehicle registration authority to issue a credential. This flow consists of establishing a secure connection between the two entities on Zootopia. The vehicle sends an issue credential request uh, to the registration authority on Zootopia. The vehicle registration authority receives the issue credential request and asks the vehicle to prove by reading uh, decentralized identity information from the ITN network. Um, the vehicle receives a request proof message from the registration authority and presents the proof back to the registration authority on Zootopia. The registration authority then receives the proofs, verifies it, issues a vehicle credential and sends it to the vehicle on Zootopia. The vehicle then receives the issued credential and stores it in their self-sovereign digital twin. Uh, the self-issue CO2 emission credential flow is the most simple flow where a vehicle self-issues a CO2 emission credential. This flow consists of one operation, which is the vehicle self-issuing the reporting data credential and storing it in uh, their self-sovereign digital twin. So taking the data from the OBFCM device, the lifetime uh, distance and fuel consumed or energy, um, and then storing that in their digital twin. 
And then finally, the verify CTO emission credential flow, where a vehicle sends two credentials from its wallet and sends as a verified presentation. A verified presentation is just when you take two verifiable claims and put them together, basically. Um, this flow consists of the following operations, establishing a secure connection between two parties, the vehicle and the European Commission on Zootopia. The vehicle takes the two credentials from its self-sovereign digital twin, the vehicle credential, which was issued by the registration authority, and the reporting data credential, which it issued itself because it just comes from the OBFCM device. Uh, the vehicle then creates a verifiable pre presentation, which includes both credentials and sends it to the European Commission on Zootopia. Uh, sorry about the numbering of these bullet points. I just noticed it's wrong, but anyways. The European Commission receives the verifiable presentation, validates it, um, and then sends the validation result back to the vehicle on Cytopia. The vehicle receives a validation result from the European Commission and then stores it in their self-sovereign digital twin. Here's a quick summary of um, the emissions reporting process flow, uh, simplified and what we just covered. Uh, in the interest of time, I probably won't repeat it all again, just because uh, we're running out of time, but okay, I'll say it quickly. Um, so basically the vehicle receives uh, the verifiable credential from the registration authority, adds their, uh, data, their emissions data reporting information, creates a verifiable presentation, sends it to the European Commission, who receives a verifiable presentation, validates it, and then sends the validation result back to the vehicle. Uh, this is on Stopia. The hardware used uh, was 75 instances of an AWS, uh, which consisted of four virtual central processing units, eight gigs of RAM for each instance. The 1 million vehicles were split over these 75 instances. We had one instance of the relational database service on the AWS uh, consisting of 32 virtual CPUs, 128 gigs of RAM. Uh, this was used for the issuer of each member state and the European Commission verifier. So the results uh, were uh, for the issue credential flow were number of flow executions so we put this in number of flow executions per second. So how quickly can you execute the process flow I've gone through? Uh, for the issue credential flow, which was the uh, slowest, there was uh, 1,851 per second. Self-issuance due to the simplicity was uh, 10,000, so uh, very quick. And the verifiable credential flow, which was 2,380 uh, flow executions per second. Um, this was for 1 million vehicles. Uh, so although you cannot use proportionality to estimate the cost, because I mean, cost of scale as you scale up might be cheaper, more expensive anyways, but you can use proportionality for the storage and compute resources needed uh, to go from number of executions per second from 1 million to 280 million vehicles. For the emissions, monitoring uh, use case. Uh, we normally need about uh, to report once a year to the European Commission for 280 million vehicles. We would need roughly 108 number of flow executions per second. So for the um, issue credential flow, it's over 10 times faster than or, uh, what would uh, be required uh, for, or 17 times faster for, for what is required for, for this use case. Uh, conclusions. Um, so future research opportunity is to extend simulations to other blockchain for road transport use cases. Uh, the identity layer for Internet of Things devices and users is a key, implement, a key implementation for almost all mobility use cases. Uh, for a digital society, you, you need a digital identity. The European Union, and you also want privacy and security within your digital identity and to control your own data and basically everything else that GDPR states, which is the European values uh, that we have. 
the European Union has the objective to digitize different sectors as much as possible, including transport, uh, where you need identity for most of these applications. It needs to be secure, as I just said. You, you want to also, in certain situations, be able to trust the data is verified and that the history of the data is true and uh, privacy is often uh, needed on top of that. Uh, implementing and testing uh, a use case um, using the European Self-Sovereign Identity Framework. I haven't talked about this and the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure Platform. I also haven't talked about this, but this is basically um, a framework which is built with a focus on standards and uh, compliance to regulation. Although um, we, we are setting up and EPSI know that it's still far from being able to um, apply a, a test use case uh, using the European Self-Sovereign Identity Framework, but um, this is on the board to do at some point in the future to test and uh, see what the performance is and if it works well. And then also application to electric vehicles, so optimal charging station locations, green electricity, if it's been consumed or not. Uh, we also have these kind of EU brown and green bonds, so um, and we have the emission trading system. So depending on where where your energy was produced, whether it was green energy or dirty energy, you need to pay more. Um, so this is something we would like to be able to track in the future. And then other supply chain applications such as goods or sensitive materials, track and tracing. And as I mentioned, the emissions trading system applied to transport fuels, accounting for how much uh, green carbon is inside. So um, for example, if it was uh, diesel and 50% uh, of it came from rapeseed oil, another 50% came from uh, oil refinery, then uh, that would affect the, uh, how green your oil is. Um, Thank you very much. Here are some ways you can keep in touch uh, and some information with the JRC. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for uh, your attention of today's presentation. All right, thanks Dermot for your presentation. Uh, at this time, we'll see if there's any questions for Dermot. It looked like there was one in the chat. Um, so Stephen Douglas asks, was the ITN itself simulated as well, or was the simulation run on current test network? Um, so it was run, uh, it was also simulated itself, I believe. Uh, wait, sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. Can you repeat it, please? <laughs> sure. Um, the question was, was the ITN itself simulated as well? or was the simulation run on the current test network? Yeah, it was run on uh, not the current test network, but it was all run on the AWS uh, cloud infrastructure. So all virtual machines interacting with each other. Hey, Dermot, that's, that's the current test network that all the members uh, are part ah, of. Sorry, I, I misunderstood. Yes. So yes, um, yes, it was run on the test network, sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay, Dermot, uh, one question I have after viewing that is, um, what do you see some of the major challenges being moving forward in terms of um, getting everything sorted for widespread adoption and use? Um, challenge number one, uh, the proposal to amend EIDAS it needs to be voted in and not too watered down form. Um, I went through it in a lot of detail and I repeated a lot in my presentation because it's um, in its current wording, it's very exciting and I believe it will uh, have a significant change in how uh, we interact digitally within Europe. And it will really create the obligation to start to use advanced identity solutions. Uh, so really, I think if the proposal to amend the, the AI desk regulation gets voted in in its current form, it will really 
revolutionize many sectors uh, and really enable us to kind of reach the um, values behind GDPR and start to actually move towards a European single digital market. Because at the moment, the problem is, is that uh, this is what we're pushing for by the European Commission uh, is pushing for at the moment, but the current EIDAS regulation, which is informed, didn't actually, it only helped a very few citizens. Um, so basically the hope is that it gets voted on in not too damn watered down form else it won't have such far reaching consequences uh in addition we need simple simple interfaces and simple ways for users to use um these technologies there will be some levels of education which are required but really they don't need to know most of the complexities uh, behind the, the technology. They might need to know a few things like how to set up their wallet, uh, what the European uh, wallet might look like, or a few other interactive things like, okay, how maybe they want to use MetaMask, maybe they want to. So they'll need to know some basics, but most of the complexities behind the technology and interaction with said technology should be um, hidden in the background and not uh, forced on the user as, I mean, really your, your grandmother needs to be able to use these um, applications. So they, it needs to be simple. Uh, the control over the data needs to be easily to say who has access for when and for what application. Uh, but really the most exciting thing is, is putting citizens in control of their own data and identity and the sheer number of applications and use cases that will come out of this, I think uh, will be staggering. And this will really enable Europe to move towards a, a single digital market. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, we do have one more question. We'll try to squeeze in here. This one's from Chris. Uh, is there another mobility BT BC test planned? Uh, a follow-up to this test, perhaps? So at the moment, we're just winding down from uh, this project, uh, uh, which we've been collaborating with Mobion. Um, we will, at the moment, we, we wrote a science for policy report, which contains all the findings and information of uh, this pilot we did with Moby, plus a, a couple other pilots we've done. Uh, and this, this information will be published, uh, I would say, probably in about a month. And once, uh, once this is out and published, then we will start looking at next steps. Uh, we already have some additional publications we want to do, uh, but um, Really, once this science for policy report is out, then we will start looking at next steps uh, for our team and, and our project. Awesome. Thank you, Dermot. Um, we are at the top of the hour, so we will go ahead and close it out. Thanks again to Dermot for coming and presenting to us today. Uh, anyone who is looking for the video capture of this talk, it will be on uh, the Moby website tomorrow. Uh, so feel free to grab it and share it. Uh, thanks again, and everyone take care. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.